Good evening. It's good to see everyone again. This evening's message is called Stones of Fire, Sons and Daughters of the Living God. And we're going to pick up and go a little bit farther from where we did last night. I know in our our earlier messages, we have really spent a lot of time focusing on the negative, on the darkness. These last two messages, we're focusing on the light. We want to expose error, but if all we do is expose error and everybody goes home, you've got head knowledge. But if we show light from God's Word, when you leave here with that, that will change lives. That's what's most important. So what I want to do is open with me to a text in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read verse 19. And I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to translate using the original Greek. So if you're reading a King James, which I have, that's the only thing I read, um, don't be worried and think I'm, I'm, you know, using some corrupt version. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. In the Greek, when you look up the word sons, it means children begotten. And you can be a a male or female and be a child, right? So when you see sons of God, realize when this was written and why that, that word was used. This is including men and women. And it says that all of creation, the entire universe is waiting for this one event. For this one event. They're watching this planet to see what God can do. And God says that his glory is not in taking a mighty man and making him more mighty. God's glory is in taking the weakest and doing the impossible through them. And I'm going to give you a quick example of that. Do you remember Abraham before God changed his name? Abram. And often I've wondered about that. You know, why the change of a name? Because name was a, a symbol of character. And we know that Abraham is known as the father of faith. The father of faith. So when you, when you read that his name was Abram, I looked it up one time. And the word Abram, the name Abram, literally means a mighty father like a governor. You can be the head of a tribe and not have any children. You can be the head of a clan if you're in Scotland or Ireland and you don't have any children. But they still call you father because you're the head. Does that make sense? Abram's name meant a mighty father. He was a, a, a man that was strong. He was a, a warrior when he had to defend his family. Um, he was wealthy. He was very gifted, but he did not have any children. And one day God came to him and said, I'm going to change your name today. And Abram knew that years before God had made a promise to him, that he was going to give him a son. And years had passed by, and he still had no child. And you can imagine what that was like for his wife, Sarah. So God is talking to Abram there alone one day, and he tells him, I'm changing your name. So Abram knew this was a big event, and he waited. And God said, your name will not be Abram anymore, but Abraham or Abraham. For I am making you a father of a great multitude. Now, this is not recorded in the Bible. But when I use my mind and a sanctified imagination, I imagine what it must have been like for Abraham when he gets back to camp that day. 
you know, do I tell everybody? Do I not tell everybody? I mean, you know, what am I supposed to do? And, and he probably couldn't withhold the information from his dear wife. So, you know, in my mind, I think, you know, okay, well, maybe he was nervous about making a huge statement to everybody, but he went to his wife and said, and this is a parable. He went to his wife and said, honey, guess what happened today when I was praying to the Lord and I went to offer sacrifice? And she's like, what, dear? And he told her, God changed my name. And she said, what did he change it to? Abraham. And she went, a father of a great multitude. That was confirmation of the promise that God had made previously to him. And he knew they were at the point where they needed that confirmation. Just like when my wife was struggling with me being gone from home, God gave her a confirmation one day because he knew her faith was, was getting weak and she needed that. Now, we're still in the parable. Abram goes to work that week and a few days later, a man comes in on a camel, and the camel is, is stumbling into the camp. It, ha it hasn't had any water, any food in days. The man on its back is slumped over, almost dead. He has been without water and food for days. And Abraham pulls him down off you know, his, his camel, and he tells the servants, take the camel, go get it water, get it food. And he sets the man down and tells the servants, go get water for him and make a meal for him. And, and Abram gets a basin and he's washing his feet and washing his head and, and, and helping the man. And the man gets the food and he's looking around and he's, he's surprised and he's overjoyed, but he has to eat because it's been days since he's had anything. And the man's eating, and after he finally relaxes, he looks at Abram, Abraham, and he says, I can't thank you enough. My name's John. What's your name? Uh-oh. What does he say? Now, think about this for a moment if you were Abraham. If I tell him my name is Abram, I'm denying what God has promised. But if I tell him my name is Abraham, he's going to ask me, where's all your children? And then I look really foolish. You want to talk about a walk of faith? Because Abraham, from the day that God named him, he told everyone, my name is Abraham. And if they asked, where is your children? He said, they're on the way. Because God has promised and he cannot lie. Amen. Now let me show you why that matters. For the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, in our minds, that we are the children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Let me ask you a question. What do you think Jesus is waiting to inherit? Us. That's the only thing left he's waiting to inherit. The Bible says we are his inheritance. Do you know what he said in, um, in the Gospel of John? He actually said before Calvary, he told the disciples, he said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. He has no rights to me. And then a little while later he said, now is the prince of this world cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. People will still think that Satan is running this world. Why do you think Jesus said in Matthew 28, all power in heaven and earth has now been given to me. Go proclaim the glad tidings. That's why Christians are standing on that little piece of ground and they're trembling. 
they don't realize that Christ is king. They think for some reason that he's still struggling with overcoming. He's just waiting on us to take hold of his promises. Because you can't find the disciples trembling in fear after the Holy Spirit fell upon them on the day of Pentecost. They were afraid before that day, but after that day, they went boldly. It didn't matter if it was the Caesar or if it was the Pope in Rome. It made no difference. They had no longer any fear. Jesus is not waiting to inherit anything except you and I. Now listen to what he says here in 1 John. Beloved, now are we the sons and daughters of God. And it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know, not we guess, we think, we hope, we know that when he appeareth, we shall be like him. Do you know what Jesus said in the Gospel of John? I believe it was John. He said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We quoted this the other night. Do you remember? And do you remember what Sister White said? This command is a promise. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus also said, it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, If the first fruits is holy, then the whole lump is holy. And you think, yeah, but I'm not holy. I had one brother that asked me one day, he said, This can't be true that you're telling me that that Jesus did it all for me because if he did, how come I still sinned yesterday? And I asked him, I said, and I was praying. I was like, Lord, help me. I looked at him and I said, if you know that you died in Christ and that you are now dead unto sin, why did you fall yesterday? He was standing on the dark side of the cross, looking forward, waiting for something to take place. Sister White said we are to stand on the sunny side of the cross, knowing what was finished at Calvary and claiming it as our own. How can I continue to sin knowing that I died? I'll never forget the day... I'll never forget the day that I I was calling out to a man for help. And we may have talked about this, but I was calling out for help and I could not get victory over a certain sin in my life. And I called this man, I found him, he had written an article online that really inspired me with hope. And I called this older gentleman and I said, I need help. And he said, what's wrong? And I told him and he said, Eric, you know what's wrong with you? And I said, what? He said, you're still very much alive. And I thought, you know, that's ignorant. Of course I'm alive. He said, no. He said, you don't understand. I said, you're right. I don't understand. He said, you're still very much alive. That's why sin still has a hold on you. And I said, I don't understand. He said, let me give you an example. He said, let's say that I send you to uh, this fancy, the fanciest hotel in Fresno, $500 a night for the rooms. I send you there to pick up a package for me that's in the lobby. You got to wait in the lobby. So you go in and you sit down there in one of those lobby chairs. And while you're sitting there, you didn't realize they were having the Miss America pageant at that hotel, at the conference center. So you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, these 20 or 30 women come walking through in their bathing suits. He said, what happens to you? And I said, oh, man, there's a battle. 
I'm trying to look at the floor and I'm looking at the floor and my mind is still going, I'm not going to look at that. I wonder what color that bathing suit was that just walked by that I'm not going to look at. That was the struggle I was dealing with as a, as a man. And I could not seem to get the victory over it. And he told me, he said, your, your pulse rate's probably going up. He said, you've got blood that's circulating on the surface of the skin. He said, you're battling. I said, yes, I'm battling. He said, are you winning? I said, I'm not looking. He said, but you're thinking about it. Jesus said, if you've looked and desired, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And I said, there, I said, there you go. That's what's wrong. I said, I have been battling for 35 years, and I still don't have the victory. I said, and I can't seem to get it. He said, it's because you're still alive. He said, now, he said, I'm going to bring, he said, I'm going to go down to the hospital. I'm going to go into the morgue. There was a man that died there a week ago. They've still got him because something came up with the funeral arrangements. He's been dead for a week. I'm going to go in, I'm going to get his body, I'm going to put it on a stretcher, put it in an ambulance. I bring the body down to the hotel room, I wheel him in on a stretcher, I pick him up and I'm setting this corpse down right next to you on that seat. He said, now rewind. Those 20 or 30 young ladies all come walking through in their bathing suits and bikinis and he says, you're on your face battling. He said, what's happening to the dead man? I said, nothing. He said, that's exactly right. He said, you don't realize that you died with Christ. You're still very much alive. He said, the only way you will ever get victory is if you count Christ's death as your own. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Amen. Amen. John chapter 3. Very familiar story. Nicodemus. He was a very righteous man by the letter of the law. He was not one of the Pharisees that was cheating on his wife or cheating on his temple tax or, or eating pork when nobody was looking. Nicodemus was an upright man by man's standards. But yet he came to Jesus that night alone. And he was older than Jesus. Jesus was a young man. That's why Nicodemus couldn't come see him during the daytime. Jesus had just turned 30 years old when his ministry began. You weren't even considered a man until 30. So Nicodemus here, and I don't know how old he was, but just probably guessing, you know, 50, 60, maybe 70. He was an elder, very respected, member of the Sanhedrin. He comes to Jesus and he tells Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he says, we know that you are from God. We know you came from God because no man can do the miracles that we see you doing except God be with him. That means in him, Emmanuel. Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he knew what the question was. Same question I was. I'm going to church. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm a vegan. I'm, I'm doing all the right things, but something is still missing. And Jesus knew something was missing in Nicodemus' life. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he said, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. It's not optional. The born-again experience is not like, well, I'll do that if I get a chance. If you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said so. The next question that came out of Nicodemus' mouth was, how is this possible? Can an old man like me enter back into his mother's womb? And when I read that, 
the same thought went through my mind. How? How does that happen? That's what I want, Jesus. And I'm there at the house by myself, and I look up into heaven, and I'm like, how? I really, I, I have no pride anymore. How does this happen? And you know, a thought came to my mind, and I know it was God that brought it to my mind. Jesus wasn't mocking Nicodemus. He wasn't making fun of Nicodemus, you know. I mean, that's not even in Christ's character. Because Jesus asked Nicodemus, he said, are you not a master, a, a, a PhD in Israel? Aren't you the one that teaches not only Sabbath school, but you're a church leader, and you don't understand these things? The only way that Jesus could ask Nicodemus that question is if somewhere in the Old Testament, the born-again experience had already been revealed. I'd never thought about that before. I always thought, you know, born again, that's New Testament. He wouldn't have asked Nicodemus if Nicodemus couldn't have known. And I, I looked at the Lord, I said, Lord, wow, show me where this is. I want to show you. This is important. Make a note of this. It's in Galatians. And it's so clear, I thought, I can't believe I've missed this. Galatians chapter 4. Paul here is, is, is trying to help God's children to understand the difference between achieving eternal life and righteousness by their own works and achieving it by faith. Living faith, faith that works by love, but faith in Christ Jesus. And listen to what he says. He says, tell me, verse 21, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one or first by a bondmaid, a slave and the other, the second son, by a free woman. He, and I'm paraphrasing this, he that was born of the bondwoman or slave was born after or by the flesh. But he that was born of the free woman was by promise. God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah. Isaac didn't come because of Abraham and Sarah figuring out some special kind of herb or a special way to do certain things or doing a yoga class. Or Isaac came because God had made a promise and he cannot lie. Now look over at verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. And the word of there is also by. We are children by promise. By promise. That's how a person is begotten again. Now I want to show you what the other side says, what the dark side. Deepak Chopra, we talked about him the other night. He said, in reality, we are divinity in disguise and the gods and goddesses in embryo that are contained within us seek to be fully materialized. There's a quote from the Shaolin Grandmaster's textbook that says, the dragon dwells deep inside of every person waiting for the person to give them permission to come out. I don't believe that. The devil only abides in the hearts of those that refuse to allow Christ to come in and take possession. John Stevens, we, we looked at this earlier, he said, martial ways are spiritual disciplines to be practiced for the sake of enlightenment. And this enlightening is what the occult world and what the Eastern mystical world, it's what they all say being born again is, being enlightened, 
through certain techniques, through saying mantras, through spiritual exercises. They say that's what happens to have this change that they call the born-again experience. This is a quote from Marcus J. Borg before he passed away. Listen to what he writes. And this is an image from a Catholic encyclopedia. You have Jesus on the left-hand side. You know he's the Catholic Jesus because he has those two fingers crossed. That means I'm king and priest. That's what the Pope claims to be, king and priest. If you look on the left-hand side, that is the Buddha. And the Catholic Encyclopedia actually talks about the Buddha, and they made him a saint many years ago. They called him Saint Josephat, and they list him. They say, this is the Buddha. In their encyclopedia, they sainted him. One of the popes did. He says, enlightenment as an archetypal religious metaphor belongs to a mystical way of being religious. Outside of the Jewish and Christian traditions, the best known enlightenment experience is the Buddha's mystical experience. This is from a previous pastor. This is one of the men that all the spiritual formation leaders and teachers looked up to and trained under. Such an experience leads to seeing everything differently. It's not simply an intellectual or mental seeing as when you say, oh, I see what you mean. Rather, enlightenment as a religious experience involves communion or union with what is an immediate knowing of the sacred. Now, it's funny he uses the word union and he uses the word communion right before it. That should give us a hint. When we take communion, the Lord's Supper, it's becoming one with Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us that if we do so unworthily, we're eating and drinking damnation to ourselves. If I take communion without faith that Christ not only died but rose again, all I'm left with is his death. And Paul says, for that reason, many in our churches are sick, have disease, and many sleep. They're eating and drinking, but they're only partaking of the death. They don't have living faith in the resurrection. He says, this type of enlightenment, this is what he calls the born-again experience. Ellen White says, through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God, but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel by contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions. The heathen had lost a knowledge of God and have become more and more corrupt. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. That's what the Buddhists do, the Hindus, the Muslims, you name it. Now, unfortunately, she says, so it was with Israel. So it is with most Christians that are alive today. They are striving through their own works and they don't have any comprehension of what the born-again experience really is. Many people go, they go into the baptismal pool and they come up and they go, it was a symbol. They don't realize that when they went under that water, they literally died with Christ. It's a proclamation that I believe I'm dead and I do not live anymore. And when I rise, I rise with him to walk in newness of life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. 
I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. He tells us, blessed be or praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope, a living assurance by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When I read that, I was like, all right, Lord, you're telling me I have to be born again. But here you're telling me that God, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I was like, is this something still yet to be achieved? Or is it something I am supposed to take hold of by faith? Peter goes on and says, Whom, having not seen, you love, and in whom... You remember we talked about that in Ephesians? In Christ, in Him, in whom? It says, in whom, though now you see Him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end or the result of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, I want to share something with you right here. This is important. Of everything we've talked about this week, this is the most important thing that I'm going to share. In whom? In whom? When you go to Ephesians chapter 1, there's a promise given there in verse 4. Actually, verse 3 and 4. Ephesians chapter 1. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's funny because that's how, that's how Peter says. Same exact opening. The word blessed means praise be. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who hath. Is hath future It's past. It's done. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly. The word places is supplied by the translators. You'll see it's italicized in the King James. When you look that up, it says, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavens. In Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And I read that verse one day when I was sitting at home and I said, Lord, That says you chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then the Apostle Paul goes on in Philippians 3 verse 9, and it says, I pray that we might be found in Him, not having our own righteousness which is by the law, but the righteousness which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. And I said, I found the key to the gospel. It's being in Him. And I I was so excited. I mean, I'm there at the house by myself, and my wife's at school, children are at school, and I was like, this is the key. After all these years, I'm 48 years old, and I'm like, why didn't I see this when I was 10? The whole key to the entire gospel is being found in Him. And then you know what happened? A question came to my mind. How do I get in him? And I looked up, and and I know God laughs at me. I know he does. I mean, you know, like a father would laugh at a child. And I know Jesus was like, Dad, watch this. 
I mean, think about that. The Bible says Christ is our elder brother. And he's there and he's thinking, oh, this is beautiful. His eyes are being opened. And I looked up and I said, Lord, thank you for showing me this key. How do I get in Jesus? And you know, our God, he has got a sense of humor. Do you know what he said to me? I heard him just as clear as day. You know how he speaks in your heart? and you can't, you can't explain that to somebody else. But you know when God talks to you. God spoke to me. I heard him just as clear as day. And he said, Eric, how did you get in your mom? How did you? And I thought, this is Nicodemus all over again. God said, how did you get in your mother's womb? And I looked up and I laughed and I said, God, I didn't have anything to do with that. He said, "Uh uh-huh. Eric, how did you get in your father's loins to get put in your mother's womb? And I paused. And I looked up and I said, God, I didn't have anything to do with that. And he smiled and he said, now you're beginning to understand love and mercy. And I said, Lord, I believe you, but I need a verse because I could never share this with someone just because I know you're telling me, but I need a verse. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. Listen to what it says. God is so beautiful. He spoke in my heart and I asked him, chapter 1, verse 29 through 31 of 1 Corinthians. I asked him for confirmation in his word and he he showed me. I mean, within moments he showed me. He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Ask and I will answer, you will receive. So I started flipping the pages, and I had the, I had the verse underlined. Listen to what he says, verse 29. So that no flesh should glory in my presence. For of him, God, are you in Christ Jesus, who of or by God is made unto us, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God put us in Christ Jesus, and he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I can't put myself back in Christ. It was done. And people say, yeah, but what about those that are lost? Where's your focus? Where is your focus? One lady wrote to Ellen White and she said, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And you know what Ellen White told her? She wrote back to her and she said, you know what? She said, the Lord revealed to me. When you're walking through the pages of his word, she said, all you're finding are the thorns. She said, I encourage you to spend an hour a day looking for the pinks and the roses. Stop focusing on the negative. Focus on the promise. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Amen. God said, I put you there. Now walk by faith in it. 1 Peter 1, Whom having not seen, speaking of Christ, you love, and whom, though now you see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, 
receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation and freedom of your souls. Isaiah, it's not just New Testament. Isaiah 45, verse 22 through 25, the Lord says, Look unto me and be ye saved. He doesn't say strive to be, try to be, hope to be. He says be, just like he says be ye holy, for I am holy. He says I am the Lord, I speak righteousness. And I asked the Lord one day, I said, Lord, What does that look like? You speak righteousness. I said, I don't mean to push you, but show me so that I can see it. And you know what the Lord did? He took me right to Luke chapter 5. There was a leper that came to Jesus. And that leper, and I'm going to tell you in a parable form. That means I'm adding some thoughts that might have happened, could have happened. makes sense that it happened, but it's not there in the Bible. Okay, so bear with me. Sanctified imagination. This leper comes to Jesus, throws himself on the ground, and you know everybody else fled because he had HIV. It was the same thing. Do you understand? Incurable and contagious as far as to the max. He throws himself on the ground after everybody has fled knowing he could be put to death even for being there. And he cast himself on the ground and he says, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Well, first thing, son of David means I'm saying you're king. You're the one that was promised would come. You're king. I know you can do anything. And Jesus looked at him and said, Son, you're a mess. I mean, you've got like leprosy. And the man said, I know. And Jesus said, have you been to the hospital? The man said, they said I was incurable. I mean, it's incurable. This disease can't be cured. There's no medicine. I'm incurable. And Jesus said, have you been to the church? Have you been to the Seventh-day Adventist church? There's one right down the road. And the man said, yeah, I went there, but they quoted scripture to me. They told me as a man sows, so shall he reap. You know how the devil does that sometimes? You made your bed, lie in it. You know what God's word says in Hosea 13? He says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king For where is any other that may save thee in all of thy cities? This man looked at Jesus and he said, I know if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You know what Jesus said? I will be thou clean. John chapter 15 verse 3, Jesus said, Now, today, you are clean through the word which I am speaking unto you. Today, you don't have to wait. You don't have to be on probation for six weeks. There's no amount of time that will wash away your past, even if that was yesterday or this afternoon. You've got to take hold of his word and say, it's mine now in this moment. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. That's the same God that called the light out of darkness. He said, let there be light, and there was. I have sworn by myself, yea, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return unto me void. Surely shall they say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall all men come, and all those that are incensed and angry against him will be ashamed. For in the Lord shall all the seed and children of Israel be justified and shall glory. 
Now you ask yourself, how can I be in Christ? There was an article, and I'm going to make this very short because I don't want to run out of time. There was a sermon that was preached by a a man named W.W. Prescott. He preached it at the 1895 camp meeting in Australia. He preached over 30 messages at that one camp meeting. If you would like me to send you the message that I'm about to share with you, I'll send it to you by email. He brought something out I'd never seen before. And I'm not going to read it, but I just want to give you the reference. It's in Hebrews chapter, I believe chapter 6 or 7. Let me just make sure. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 7. The first 10... First 10 or 12 verses, it actually says that when Abraham was paying tithe to Melchizedek, that Levi, who was his great-grandson, was in Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. And Levi hadn't even been born yet. Did you ever notice that before? Do you know that when Adam sinned, every single one of us was in him physically? When I met my wife 25, 26 years ago, my son and my daughter were inside of me when I met her. I didn't even have any intention of having children. That's scientific. That's that's science. They know that. My children were inside of me. That little, whatever that was, that little DNA and that genetic blueprint, it went out of me when my wife and I became one and God, between the union of a husband and a wife, he took that blueprint and he made it into flesh. My children were in me. You were in Adam when he fell. That's why the Bible says we were born with the sentence of death already on us. People will tell me, no, you're a sinner because of what you do. Well, then how come babies die at three days old or at one day old? They die because the sentence of death was already on them. That's why Christ became the second and last Adam. Ellen White says he took the first Adam's place as head of the human race. Adam came from Christ. So Christ was the only one that could stand in Adam's place. When you look at what happened there in Hebrews, Levi was in Abraham when Abraham was paying tithe. And Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, that Levi was paying tithe in Abraham, even though he hadn't been born yet. Do you know what that means? That means that if you are in Christ, because you believe what God says, he already said he chose you in him before the foundation of the world, then that means you were in him when he was winning every victory. And you were in him when he was dying on Calvary. And you were in him when he was being raised from the grave. And you were in him when he was set down on the throne on high. Why do you think Paul says we are seated with Christ in the heavens? How can we be there if we're still here? We're in him. Now listen to what the servant of the Lord says. After Jesus, was, after Jesus had been baptized by John in Jordan, he went straightway up out of the water to the bank of the river, and he bowed in the attitude of prayer. He here identifies himself with sinners as our representative. In taking upon him our sins and numbering himself with transgressors. In his prayer, 
Christ with his human arm, his human nature, encircles fallen humanity while with his divine arm he is reaching for the throne of the infinite. His hands were raised upward and his eyes were fixed as if penetrating heaven. And he poured out his soul in supplication to his Father for strength to meet our unbelief and sinfulness. And I'm paraphrasing that. Do you see? Remember, when you read, you have to read this as it's spoken to you individually. Otherwise, God's word and promises won't have any power. He pled for power to break the power of Satan over man and to be able to overcome Satan in behalf of man. He presented humanity before his father asking that he would grant to fallen man the light and strength and power from his own throne to successfully overcome the prince of the power of darkness. Never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were solicitous, ready and willing and eager to bear to the praying Redeemer messages of assurance and love. But no, the Father himself will minister to his Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light of the glory of God. The heavens were opened and beams of light and glory proceeded therefrom. The people stood spellbound with fear and amazement. Their eyes were fastened upon Christ, whose bowed form was bathed in the beautiful light and glory that ever surround the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had never before seen the face of man. The thunders rolled and the lightnings flashed from the opening heavens, and a voice came therefrom in terrible majesty, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That quote is from Youth Instructor, March 1, 1874. Now let me read the next statement to you. This is Desire of Ages, page 112 to 113. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, embraces all humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all of our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless, for he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. The light which fell from the open portals of heaven upon the head of our Savior will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Do you understand what we just saw and read. We were in Christ when he was baptized. You go through Ellen White's writings and type in Holy Spirit. Read everything you can find from her and remember something. God was revealing more and more light to her as she got older. It wasn't like she was given all the light in 1844 and boom, it stopped. There was times in 1888 after she heard E.J. Wagner share about the two covenants, she wrote, she said, we may have been wrong in our understanding of the covenants until I heard what Wagner presented. 
She said, I had never even considered the two covenants the way he presented it. She said, we may have been wrong. This is important. We were in Christ. That means when we ask the Father for the gift of His Spirit, we already have Christ's righteousness as the assurance we will receive if we abide in Him. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 15 verse 7? Abide in me. And you think, what do you have to do to abide in a house? Well, you have to be put there first. If I'm on the outside of the house and somebody says, abide in there, and I go, in where? Well, in the house. But I've never been in there before. I don't even know what it looks like in there. You can't abide somewhere unless you have already been put there. It means stay in me. When Christ was baptized, Ellen White says, and the scripture says, you were in him being baptized. When we go down into the water now, when we give our lives to the Lord, it is a symbol. It is saying, Lord, I believe that I was in him back there 2,000 years ago. Not only was I baptized, but when Christ won the victory, Ellen White says, so few Seventh-day Adventists have any understanding of what took place in the wilderness of temptation. They don't make what happened to Christ their own. The Bible says, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. When did he give us the victory? We are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Christ is our victory our righteousness, our wisdom, our justification, our glorification. It's all Him. And as we realize that, our hearts are broken, pride is expelled, and there's a love that is given to us that nothing can extinguish. Ellen White says it's love that begets love, not fear. So when you are looking at your son or your daughter or your wife or the drunkard on the street or the girl that just got caught and she's had an abortion or whatever, you've got to say, God loves you. He chose you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen.